has clearly gotten out of hand now, yes. But it was worth the risk. I assure you. Every genre has to start somewhere, and with the first person shooter, it started with id Software in the early 90s. While one of their first titles, Commander Keen, relied on more traditional game development of that era, sharing similarities to Mega Man or Super Mario, id wasn't satisfied with replicating games the industry had seen before. Enter Wolfenstein 3D, a revolutionary 3D shooter unlike anything the industry had seen up to that point. Hot off their success with Commander Keen and Wolfenstein, id wanted to put the 3D engine John Carmack had developed to good use, and push the envelope for the new genre that they had created, and thus, out of the dark and twisted recesses of John Romero's mind, crawled one of the most controversial and influential games the world has ever seen. Doom. The surge in popularity of Doom was in part to not only its mature nature, slaughtering demons from hell in the best blood and guts 90s Windows computers could muster, but also due to its risky but successful shareware distribution method of allowing free copies to players and encouraging them to share their experience and game with friends. With the strategy paying off, Doom would see several re-releases, content editions, and sequels spanning over a decade. Although its success was hard to ignore, upon the release of the middling reception of Doom 3 in 2004, the demon-killing franchise that spawned a sensation slowly receded into the background, relinquishing its title the first person shooter king as series like Call of Duty, Battlefield, and Medal of Honor fought for the throne. Laying dormant for more than a decade, Doom came ripping and tearing back into the scene in the form of Doom 2016, a reboot that showed that while Romero and Carmack might have departed, it are still masters of their craft. Pardon my French, but Doom's reboot is f phenomenal, which stems from gameplay being the number one priority on id's to-do list. Controlling the Doom Slayer is as close as one might get to being Arnold in his prime. From his fast-paced movement, platforming abilities, massive arsenal, and brute strength, Doom Slayer is the perfect killing machine. Doom 3's diversions from its predecessor's emphasis on speedy gunplay was seen as a detriment, focusing more on a horror element rather than relishing in death and destruction. Doom's return to form goes back to its roots, and it's for the better. Doom's speed is key to its success when you get down to the core of what sets this franchise apart. There isn't anything quite like speeding around arenas, circle strafing around demons, and blasting them all back to hell. It's immensely satisfying, primarily because it takes skill to balance constant movement while being aware of every enemy position, which enemies you're facing down, and their attack patterns on top of unloading everything you've got and quickly swapping through weapons to keep up fire. Standing still is like offering up the demons a free meal. It's a stark contrast to the slow, stop and aim gameplay of Doom's competition. While both have their merits, and the discussion between comparing the two is valid, I can say Doom is miles more rewarding. There's no squad of NPCs to back you up, no enemies hiding or at long distances so you have to carefully line your shots up for, no regenerating health, it's just the Doom Slayer facing off against hordes of Hell's minions with only his skills to even the fight. Doom retains its origins dedication to its almost arcadey design. No reloading or aiming down sights like the majority of first person shooters on the market. Old school power-ups feel right at home, granting players faster movement speed or the ability to tear the opposition to pieces with your bare hands. Jump pads add verticality into the mix, making the combat even more hectic. Keeping an eye out for health packs or armor items is integral for surviving, and just like almost everything about Doom, is implemented near perfectly. While there are health and ammo pickups scattered throughout levels, Doom has a fantastic system for generating them through gameplay. New to the reboot, Doom has an execution system. Doing enough damage to enemies will cause them to glow. Clicking down the right stick initiates a brutal glory kill, dispatching that enemy and dropping health as a result. As I mentioned in my Gears of War video, I'm all for over the top and bloody executions, and while they are fun to watch in Gears, I'll admit they serve no actual purpose gameplay-wise. They're only rewarding in a superfluous way, acting as catharsis to get back at an opponent who may have been on your nerves. In Doom, it grants a small bit of health, which is another component thrown into the combat. While keeping track of everything I previously laid out, now when players' health is low, their priorities switch to trying to execute as many demons as possible to regain health and keep the fight going. These glory kills are aptly named too, with a wide variety to perform on every demon the game has to offer. They're quick, flashy, and while some might see them as intrusive, stopping the gunplay for a little more than a second, they serve a vital gameplay purpose while also being satisfying as hell. On the flip side, generating ammo is done similarly when equipping the chainsaw. We'll get to the rest of the arsenal soon enough, but the chainsaw is important for a few reasons. One, while it's the only one of its kind, it's a nice change of pace from the constant shooting, acting as an up-close and personal melee weapon that insta-kills almost any demon in the game, besides bosses of course. And two, gnawing your way through the flesh and guts of a demon with the chainsaw results in an explosion of ammunition of 
all types, effectively replenishing any spent ammo during the battle. This means the player is never without an option in combat. If you're low on health, execute a demon here or there to get some back, and if you run out of ammo, break up the chainsaw and get to work. The combat in Doom is akin to a dance, skating around the arena and the demons that have infested it, knowing which weapons to use on which enemies and always being aware of your armor, health, and ammo, and when either are depleted, correcting your strategy on the fly to accommodate for the situation. Doom's smooth control and speed set a refreshing pace for the genre that's been oversaturated with military-style first-person shooters over the years. While there have been standouts like Borderlands, Bulletstorm, Titanfall, and ironically the new Wolfenstein reboots, Doom stands tall amongst its competition for its speed and tempo. That's just the combat on the technical side. The weapons the Doom Slayer wields elevates the combat system tenfold, with nine demon slaying weapons at its disposal, another aspect that sets Doom apart from the typical first-person shooter, who usually equips players with two weapons. Both shotguns, of the pump action and double barreled variety, are flat out awesome, and are usually my go-to weapons. A few automatic weapons are available in the form of a traditional assault rifle and plasma rifle, differentiated by the fact that the former is a hit-scan weapon and the latter is projectile-based, making both stand out in their own way. There's a myriad of heavy weapons available as well, although their ammo runs out pretty quickly. Classics like the rocket launcher that does massive damage, or an imposing chain gun that spools up and decimates anything in its path. A ghost rifle that's tricky to land shots at such high speeds but when it does, it's tremendously effective, and of course, who could forget the granddaddy of them all, the BFG, which fires a projectile that disintegrates anything in its vicinity. The weapon sandbox in Doom is stellar, and it should be. When shooting monsters in the face is really the only string to your bow, you better nail it, and id certainly nailed it, and then some. Similar to the glory kills, being new additions to the franchise, Doom's reboot also added more traditional mechanics seen in the industry today, such as buffs and character and weapon upgrades. Finding these little upgrade robots allows a Doom Slayer to improve one of his weapons, whether that's added firepower or a secondary fire such as a charge shot or a grenade launcher. These upgrades are a great new addition, essentially expanding the roster of weapons and the ways players can kill demons. These upgrades are further enhanced by weapon upgrade tokens granted to the player based on their combat ability. On top of that, rune challenges are scattered throughout Mars and Hell, acting as quick fire minigames of sorts, focusing on players' combat skills. Acquiring runes allows for passive buffs to players' already stacked set of abilities. These features and mechanics facilitate more exploration for the player throughout Doom's amazing level design. Throughout the last decade, gamers have been subjected to some of the worst first-person shooter level design around. Long stretches of linear corridors asking nothing of the player except stop, aim, shoot, move up, repeat ad nauseum for about six to eight hours. Not Doom though. Doom's non-linear approach to its level design is such a breath of fresh air in an industry bereft of classic first-person shooter design. Levels are designed with non-linear areas to explore and chart out that lead to a plethora of arenas to battle in, usually requiring players to defeat waves of demons or destroy a nest or plot and important device. Levels require a map for navigation, secrets are littered everywhere for players to find, puzzle keys crop up requiring backtracking and knowledge of the level's inner workings, platforming sections tied to Doom Slayer's ability to climb up ledges and double jump add way more variety than expected. Doom's level design is near perfect for its genre. It's open enough to fuel player expression, whether that's in combat, exploration, or platforming. It's focused enough that players aren't getting needlessly lost or wasting time running across massive spaces without anything to do. Needless to say, Doom's success hinges on its fantastic fantastic combat benefiting from its equally fantastic level design. This combination culminates in one of the best power trips since the original Halo. The power fantasy Doom creates is unmatched since its launch nearly three years ago. The upgrades I alluded to earlier not only allow for the expansion of your arsenal, but making you a stronger fighter. While exploring, players will come across items such as Argent Cells or Praetor Tokens that can upgrade several aspects of the Doom guy. These include small tweaks such as the compass pulsating near secret areas, increasing the length of time that power-up will remain active or decreasing recharge duration for equipment, among several other options. They're a small portion of the overall ways id successfully crafted feeling like a badass behind Doom Slayer's visor. Like almost everything in Doom, it achieved this through gameplay. Like any veteran developer, id crafted a wonderful difficulty progression through tangible means, more so than artificial ones. Instead of arbitrary level ups that tell players they're stronger, Doom's variety of enemies and the way they're paced throughout the entire campaign contributes to a fantastic pace and establishes a cohesive sense of immersion when players try to attach themselves to the Doom Slayer. Starting out with zombies and imps, players will quickly climb the ranks of Hell's forces. Each new enemy the player faces is treated as a sort of mini-boss, and defeating them is a Herculean task. Afterwards, set enemies are folded 
molded into the ranks of the players we'll face from then on, taking on Mancubuses, Kakio Demons, and Reavers like it's no big deal towards the end of the campaign. Battling through your first Hell Knight encounter is a tough fight, and overcoming that is rewarding, but taking them on in groups along with any other possible combination of enemies is why Doom's pace is so great. While we're on the subject of enemies, Doom's plethora of demonic bullet sponges are grotesquely fantastic. From the fast-moving imp to the Baron of Hell and everyone in between are designed in a way that they're all recognizable from a design perspective to determine how to handle them in the heat of the battle. Identifying what's on the battlefield based on the unique designs of all the monsters is another key ingredient to Doom's combat, whether that's taking stock of the airborne enemies like the Kakio demons or summoners, to sorting through the ground forces like charging pinkies or circle strafing around massive mancubuses. Yet another layer of Doom that makes it so damn good. And the icing on this Doom-themed cake is undoubtedly Mick Gordon's magnum opus. There's no other way to put this, Doom 2016's soundtrack is a work of art. With a mix of heavy metal and dubstep, Doom's soundscape is sheer perfection. I can't put it into words, so just let your ears do the work. God damn, that is some good stuff. Mick Gordon and id's audio department should be commended for the innovations with Doom's soundtrack. Racervic has a great video on how Doom's soundtrack programmatically syncs with the player's actions and how that results in a heightened sense of immersion. I recommend checking that out. Doom's success in 2016 spun out into several different horizons for the franchise. Doom made its way to VR in the aptly named Doom VFR for the PSVR. That's a mouthful. But one of the more interesting and important new inclusions was a Nintendo Switch port. Helmed by the wizards over at Panic Button, Doom came ripping and tearing onto a Nintendo console for the first time in a very long time. And while there are obvious downsides, such as the removal of the snap map feature, visual downgrades, and running at 30 frames per second rather than a smooth 60 frames, it's a miracle we even got this port in the first place. And once you settle in to the slower frame rate and the muddier textures, it's a portable Doom 2016, and there's really no way that isn't awesome. On top of that, Doom Eternal, which is also coming to the Switch somehow, is launching in 2019 and looks better than its predecessor with added mobility mechanics, even more open level design, and a far more interesting looking story. Speaking of the story, Doom isn't anything to write home about, but I don't think that's a bad thing. If anything, id possessed a lot of self-awareness when creating the story, with the Doom Slayer actively going out of his way to ignore the orders he's given, doing whatever he wants as long as he can kill demons. You need to remove each lens individually. Carefully release the hinges. There's more involved storytelling and codex entries and things of that nature if you're into it, but if you just want to run a gun, more power to you. The story isn't the only thing that's lacking in Doom, if I'm being honest. While I'll praise this game to hell and back for everything I've set up to this point, nothing's ever truly perfect. While the original Doom was known for its arena-based multiplayer, Doom's reboot multiplayer component isn't as great as it should be. That's not to say it's bad by any means, just sort of average, which is in stark contrast to the campaign. And while this game looks absolutely fantastic in the id Tech 6 engine, the game flip-flops between two locations, the Mars base and Hell, and while both locations vary in visual design, it can get a bit samey at times, with an overabundance of orange and red or white and gray color palettes, something the sequel looks to be improving on. I cannot understate how legitimately amazing Doom's reboot is. It accomplishes so much more than its competition, from the pace to the level design to its speed to the gunplay, all while staying true with its early 90s PC shooter roots. Doom's re-emergence into the genre it spawned nearly 25 years ago is a breath of fresh air for the industry and for gamers yearning for a kick-ass, no-hold-barred power fantasy. It's in the upper echelon of the first-person shooter genre genre, and simply put, it's one hell of a game. In his ravenous hatred, 